Hey, welcome. My name is Larry Hoy, Biker Rider Legend, and you've found your way to the First Chapter Podcast, where I take an opportunity to read the first chapter of some of my books. Get you hooked, just enough to get you in there. You have to go and find out more. Anyway, let's get started. All right, I have a great treat for you this week. I've been waiting for a long time to get permission to read this book. Lydia Shearer. I finally got a hold of her down at LibertyCon and got permission to introduce you to Love, Lies, and Hocus Pocus. I've got the first book in the series, Beginnings. As of today, last time I checked, there's seven books. In the and you've got to try them out. What, what can I say? Let's take a look on the back page. <clears throat> Saving the world is such a bother when it makes you late for tea. Wizard, Lily Shearer, is kept busy managing library archives and studying magic and, and trying to keep her witch friend Sebastian from dragging her into trouble. Unfortunately, he loves adventure even more than she loves being left alone. She doesn't want to investigate a malignant spell in a haunted house, but Sebastian is promising rare books as a reward. She doesn't want to hurt her family, tired of being lied to about her past doesn't want to get stuck in a dangerously unstable time loop, but Sebastian is in trouble again. The b strangling her friend is as satisfying as it might be, won't fix her problems. If she wants answers and to not miss tea, she best find the right spell for the job before everything unravels and ends them both for good. All right, Lydia, I'm looking forward to it. Let's get started with first chapter. Chapter 1. Environmentally Friendly Burgers Lily Singer wished she could simply say her date was going badly and leave it at that. But such a gross understatement was against her nature. To be accurate, she'd have to admit it was in the top five worst, not the top three. It wasn't totally unexpected. Most, actually, all of her dates were men that she'd met online who inevitably weren't as cute as their profile pictures suggested. Awkward and bookish, she found it much easier to start virtual as opposed to real conversations. Speed dating and blind dates were out of the question due to her abysmal social skills. Well, that and the fact that wizard, wizard, not a witch, wizard. So when you said you had diet restrictions, what you meant was you could only eat burgers? Lily asked, trying to keep the sarcasm out of her voice, although she suspected the only way her date would notice sarcasm was if it was dressed up like a cheeseburger. Huh? Jerry Slate, a good hundred pounds larger and ten years older than his picture online, looked up from his second burger to stare, confused, at her face. When we were setting up the date, I asked if you could pick the restaurant because you said had diet restrictions, Lily reminded him. Oh, yeah, I have a sensitive stomach. I can only eat 100% pure beef burgers, and they have to be grass-fed. Free range, you know. None of that GMO stuff. This place uses the best ingredients out there. Lily resisted the urge to roll her eyes, controlling herself with the thought that it was better to be taken to a gourmet, environmentally friendly burger restaurant than... Heaven forbid, a normal burger restaurant. Looking to the side, she gazed longingly through the restaurant's front windows to the sunlit street, busy with lunchtime traffic. If she only knew how to teleport, she could escape this awkward situation with minimal embarrassment. So, she tried again. How's your gaming campaign going? Oh, it's fantastic! <clears throat> Jerry enthused past a mouthful of half-chewed, but not forget, grass-fed burger, not slowing his consumption of burger, fries, and a handmade root beer float, he launched into a detailed description of his gaming group's latest campaign against someone. Lily couldn't remember. It was a topic she could safely rely on to keep him talking for a good while, though it bored her almost to tears. Boredom was preferable, however, to the awkward silence interposed between chewing sounds 
suffered through the first half of their date. Funny, she thought that in person Jerry would be more inquisitive, that before she'd been aware of his burger obsession, he had absentmindedly separated the carrot coins from the rest of her salad, stacked them into a tiny walled fortress between her and her droning date. She realized she hadn't he hadn't asked a single question beyond the perfunctionary, How are you? Since they'd met outside some twenty minutes before, from the time they'd entered the restaurant, his entire attention had been devoted to ordering and eating, though he had at least disengaged a few brain cells long enough to inspect of the best items on Come to think of it, he hadn't been very inquisitive online either, but Lily was good at asking questions in virtual chat. It was like doing research in, in a search engine. Type in a question, then browse through the resultant dump of information to find your answer. When asked a question, especially if said question had anything to do with himself, Jerry was obligingly verbose. He went into a great detail, as long as the detail involved the hundred different titles of grunge rock music collection, or his daring feats in the latest sneaking attack against his group's unsuspecting, no longer allies. It wasn't as if she had had soaring expectations. Just hoped for some intelligent conversation about, I'll say, books, history, or philosophy, or anything that mattered, really. Some people improved upon face-to-face -face acquaintance. Jerry was not one of them. Neither was she, come to think of it. But at least she didn't bore anyone with loving descriptions of each book in her expansive personal library, unless she knew for a fact that the person was a bibliophile. Hands nervously smoothed down the dark fabric of her pencil skirt as she cast about desperately for an excuse to prematurely end the date. She intended to block Jerry, block Jerry Slate, from her dating profile as soon as she got home. Ignoring the gaming babble coming from the other side of the table, Lily concentrated on the fork she held hand as an idea came to her. She whispered the words for a simple heat transference spell. Her other hand wrapped around the power anchor amulet she wore on to her wrist like a bracelet. Her body heat began to seep into the metal, making it grow warm she grew cooler. When she judged it was sufficiently hot, she made a startled gesture and dropping it dramatically to the table as she jerked back in her chair. Ouch! yelled. Huh? Jerry said, stopping mid-sentence. It, it seemed to be his favorite word along with, oh. I wasn't paying attention and tried to pick up my fork. Very hot. It burned my hand. They must have just washed it in an industrial washer. Jerry reached forward to touch the fork experimentally, and stopping short as he felt the heat emanating from the offending metal. Gosh, that is hot. You okay? It, you don't look so good. Jerry's brow furrowed in confusion. Not even was he absent-minded enough to miss the fact that their silverware had been sitting quite cool and harmless for a good fifteen minutes since they'd gotten there. Lily made a show of feeling her forehead, hoping to redirect his attention. I feel all clammy. I should probably go home. I could be getting sick. Thanks so much for the food. With a touch of guilt, she fled the restaurant, not looking back. If she had, she would have felt better. Jerry's momentarily stunned face quickly smoothed over as he noticed an untouched burger at her place. Not wanting to waste food, he began demolishing it as well. The warm summer air felt good on her face as Lily drove her Honda Civic down Port de, Port de Leon Avenue, heading back to Agnes Scott College campus. Her soft chestnut brown hair frizzed in the humidity, despite being pulled back into a severe bun. At least it wasn't whipping around her face and getting stuck in her glasses, as it would have had she worn it down. Verdant foliage and colorful flowers crowded around the sidewalks. Businesses and houses lining the street. 
The abundant plant life was one of the things Lily loved most about Atlanta. It made the place feel less like a big city and more like a well-tended neighborhood. Plus, it reminded her of home in the Alabama backwaters. Pulling into the college employee parking lot, Lily gathered her things and headed across campus toward McLean Library. Though originally founded as an elementary school in 1889, Agnes Scott had become a college by the early 1900s. The Kane Library, built in 1936, consisted of four main floors, a grand vaulted ceiling, ceiling reading hall, and three attached floors dedicated to the stacks. It was a beautiful example of Gothic architecture, meeting utilitarian building needs and, along with other Gothic and Victorian, red brick stone buildings around the campus, made for a beautiful, relaxing atmosphere. Though it was Saturday, Lily preferred to take refuge in the library and bury herself in paperwork rather than go home and risk an urge to mope about. All ceilings and majestic architecture and quiet atmosphere would calm her in a way no amount of tea or chocolate could. And of course, there was the comforting smell of books. She passed a few groups of girls relaxing or studying on the green. It was a women's college and the non-employee males were discouraged from hanging around campus. On this sunny day, blue sky and warm grass had lured most of the students outside to study, though she saw only a few scattered girls working quietly in the library's grand reading hall as she made her way to her office. Her office was a spacious room on the first floor with a high ceiling and expansive windows. Tall bookshelves covered most of the other three walls, and a large mahogany desk dominated the center of the room. With a sigh, she dropped her purse into one of the two visitors' chairs, both currently pushed up against bookshelves at stepladders, and sat down at her desk. The desk's dark wood surface was polished to a shine. Each item on it was arranged neatly. Her computer, pencil holder, and file organizer were placed just so, cleaned spotless and free of dust. Her shiny brass nameplate was centered and aligned perfectly parallel to the edge of the desk. It read, Lily Singer, Lillian Singer, Administrative Coordinator, Archives Manager. It was a prestigious position for Lily's relatively young 25 years of age, but the fact that the previous Archives Manager, Adam Barrington, had taken Lily under her wing and personally groomed her for the job had made Lily the obvious choice when Madame Barrington retired a year ago. Beyond the Madame's training and endorsement, however, Lily had been well prepared for the job with four years of undergraduate work, work study in the stacks, not to mention two years as head librarian after graduation. Her BA in history and a minor in the classics were just icing on the cake. Of course, Lily's love of books and organized nature and library experience weren't the only reasons behind Madame Barrington's choices. The real reason she'd needed someone to take over as curator of the basement, secret archive uh, beneath the McLean Library, containing a private collection of occult books on magic, wizardry, and arcane science. Being a wizard herself, Madame Barrington had recognized Lily's innate ability as soon as she'd begun her freshman year. The older woman had considered it her duty to keep the then young and inexperienced girl's insatiable curiosity from getting her killed. Madame Barrington had always been frustratingly vague about exactly who owned the book. Her job, and now Lily's, to care for them, study them, and act as a gatekeeper to their knowledge. Once she had seen Lily... Once, only once, had Lily seen Madame Barrington allow access, and that was to a very old gentleman who had arrived late one night and whispered something in the Madame's ear. When Lily had asked her how she had known to let someone in, Madame Barrington had simply smiled her mysterious smile and said, You'll know. Lily's worries had faded over time, as not a single person had ever appeared requesting access in the years since she'd taken over. 
Though the madam was tight-lipped on the subject, Lily got the impression there weren't many wizards left in the world. Of those who still did exist, only a select few knew of the basement's whereabouts. And that was fine with Lily, as the basement was her own personal heaven. Knowledge was the next best thing to life itself, and knowledge of the unknown and mysterious something that she craved. Ever since she could remember, long before she found out she was a wizard and started learning the craft under Madame Barrington's tutelage. The thirst got her into trouble on occasions, but just as often it resulted in exciting discoveries which added to their already encyclopedic mind. Having all of Agnes Scott's stacks, archives, considerable online research capability at her fingertips was a dream come true, not even counting the basement. Now, having settled into her leather desk chair in the sunlit office, Lily relished a moment of glowing satisfaction as she surveyed her domain. Taking a deep breath, let the disappointment and frustration of an abysmal date fade away and refocused instead on all the good things in life. Books, tea, chocolate, hats, more books. Who cared about men and dating when you had all that at your fingertips? Speaking of men, there was a flourishing knock on her office door, and without waiting for an answer, a tall, lanky man with must brown hair came in, swaggering through. His untucked shirt and worn pants gave him a disheveled look, although he walked as if he wore the finest Italian suit in the world. On a leather cord around his neck hung a huge triangular stone with a hole in the middle. He always wondered what it was, but wasn't one to ask personal questions. His grand entrance was marred slightly by the absence of a visitor chair in front of her desk, which interrupted his smooth transition from swaggering into lounging handsomely across one of them. Instead, he had to reverse direction, pull a chair over from the bookshelf, before setting his lanky form into it. Lily hid a smile, trying to look stern, and said, Sebastian, how many times do I have to tell you you're not supposed to be wandering around the campus? This is a woman's college and private property. <laughs> Sebastian waved his hand unconcerned. If you're so worried about it, call security. His eyes were bright with mischief, as if to emphasize the complete lack of concern. He reached into his pocket and drew out that silly coin was always partying with. He liked to roll it over in his knuckles and perform other slice of hand, knowing it annoyed annoyed her when he showed off. Lily rolled her eyes. She knew that she wouldn't be called he knew that she wouldn't call security, at least not until he annoyed her to the point of taught losing her temper, which wasn't often. What do I owe the pleasure of your visit? Then, propped in the palm of her hand, Lily raised a skeptical eyebrow in his direction and did her best to ignore the coin. Unlike most men, he picked up on sarcasm like he picked up on candy every time and with great glee. Oh, you know, just paying a social visit. It's been far too long, don't you think? How's the old biddy doing these days? Lily's eyes narrowed. Sebastian practically oozed casual nonchalance, which meant he was up to something. I'd like to hear you call her that to her face, and your aunt is just fine. The last time I visited her, she was enjoying a day in the garden. Still kicking, eh? Sebastian snorted, twisting a bit of his bangs around one finger. Far be it from the great Madame Barrington to grow old and die like the rest of us. Lily frowned. That's quite disrespectful. You know very well that the wizards tend to live longer than everyone else. I'm going to insult my mentor, at least have the decency to do it behind my back. Sebastian laughed, making a dismissive gesture. Lighten up, Lily. It was a, just a joke. He did disown me, after all. I'd say I've got at least the right to make jokes about her. Unlike his elderly relative, Sebastian Blackwell was a witch. No, not a wizard. A witch. The difference came from the source of their power. The wizards was innate, 
cultivated through discipline and study and channeled and shaped by will and word, often supplemented by a collection of arcane objects, a witch was entire a witch's was entirely acquired through the delicate art of give and take. Many beings, spirits, demons, and magical creatures were happy to give aid or favors to the right person in exchange for the right thing. Others could be tricked. A few could be forced, and some were to be avoided altogether. To drastically oversimplify, wizards were born, witches were made. True, though Madame Barrington was always vague when it came to wizard culture, Lily at least knew not all children of wizards were wizards themselves. It was generic like eye or hair color. The stronger the wizard and the purer the blood, the better chance of passing on the gene or whatever it was that enabled wizards to manipulate magic. So being an old, proper, and traditionalist, Adam Barrington viewed witchcraft as disgraceful and lowly, not to mention dangerous. Only shameless fools with no true ability engaged in such activities. Sebastian's view was, since he couldn't be a wizard, he might as well be something. And anyway, he made a very good witch. Lily happened to agree with Sebastian, but never said so to her mentor. It took adept social skills, a clever nature and charisma, and a force of will to live such a life and to come out on top. She'd have made a dreadful witch, as evidenced by how terrible it was interacting with anyone except with a few friends or annoying acquaintances, in the case of Sebastian, with whom she was comfortable. In the ease with which Sebastian glided around social situations made her quite jealous. He was everything she wasn't. Handsome, confident, popular, good at whatever he put his mind to, though he rarely put his mind to anything unless absolutely necessary. For it turned out he was also lazy, untidy, undisciplined. He'd have made a terrible wizard. Putting the note of darkness to her voice, did have paperwork to go through, after all. Lily fixed suggests Sebastian with a stare and asked more firmly, What do you want, Sebastian? I know you're up to something. Well, it sounds terrible when you put it like that, said Grinning. Sebastian, he said in a warning tone. Okay, okay, I'll get to the point. You're no fun. Sebastian raised his hands in surrender, muttering the last part described. I have plenty of fun. It's called reading books. Oh, right. Now it was Sebastian's turn to roll his eyes. Anyway, I need your consulting services. You mean you need my help? Lily asked sweetly, the start of a smug grin pulling at her lips. No, I need you as a consultant, one professional to another. Putting his coin away, he straightened in the chair smiling and spreading his hands wide in a disarming gesture. Obviously meant to reassure her, but it was, he was not impressed. Really? <clears throat> professional? Since when are you a professional witch? Sebastian adopted an indigent look. Since a while! Can't you just see it? Sebastian Blackwell, professional witch, said dramatically, lifting his arm to paint an imaginary sign in the air. I've got business cards and everything. Tan dove into a back pocket of his jeans and produced a rather bent card, which he flipped onto her desk with a flip of his wrist. Fascinating, Lily commented, commented, a voice barely dripping with sarcasm as she examined the card. The front showed a headshot of Sebastian, handsome, without trying as usual, beside his name and contact Details printed in overly curly font. The black and stylized monogram of purple and gold. And what services do you offer as professional witch? He asked, fighting the urge to laugh. Oh, casting out evil spirits, contacting loved ones who've passed on, consulting with the fates, various potions, you know, the normal stuff supercilious rich people believe in. Charlantry, you mean. 
Lily asked, eyebrow raised again. Hey, I can actually do most of the stuff people ask for. When they want something impossible, like talking to their dead pet parrot or predicting the lottery, I make something up. Keep them happy. Ignorance is bliss and all that. No harm done. Lily gave him a hard stare over her glasses. Hated that saying. Ignorance was one of the least blissful things in the world. In her opinion, she believed that the truth will make you free. A saying which was carved on the rafters of McCain Library, Grand Reading Hall. But she reminded herself that Sebastian wasn't her problem and got back to the point. So, what do you need my consulting services for? Well, I got hired for this job, see? And I've run across something more up your alley than mine. Is that so? Her tone remained disinterested. Then pulled into too many of his wild schemes not to be hesitant. Though, to be fair, she'd egged him on in many of those schemes whenever there was knowledge to be had or a new spell to try. Curiosity often got the better of her, and Sebastian knew it. Yes, it is so. Explain. I was hired to cast out this evil spirit, and it turns out the spirit isn't evil. He's actually a pretty nice guy. The real culprit is the spell put on the house almost a hundred years ago. Because of some jilted lover, the, sp the spirit has stayed behind to warn people away from the house ever since. So, even though he has technically been haunting the house, even if I get him to go away, that doesn't fix the problem, and I won't get my money. Let me guess. You need to figure out what the spell is and to get rid of it, right? Very astute conclusion, and I'll give you an award later. Sebastian gave a, a lazy smile and a wink. Lily was not amused. You know, you really shouldn't insult the person you're talking about getting help from, said, giving him a level stare. And you haven't even heard any compelling reason why I should help you. Oh, yes, well. Sebastian backpedaled a bit. Lily knew his good looks and charming ways usually got him what he needed, so she didn't worry about giving him too much trouble. So she delighted in giving him as much trouble as possible. A very small part of her liked to watch him squirm. Well, maybe not so. Besides, I mean, consulting for the sake of our professional friendship, there's a collection of occult books in the house, which the owner has agreed to give me part of the payment. I would, of course, hand them over to you, should you provide the aforementioned conclusion thingy. Despite her better judgment, Lily's interest in new books did that to her. She could never resist learning new things. And if there was genuine books on magic, not silly mumbo-jumbo written by someone who thought they were a wizard, they could be valuable indeed. She was always looking to add to the basement's collection, not to mention expand personal life. Still, mulling over the possibility of new books, caught sight of Sebastian's smug smile. Frowned. It annoyed her to be so predictable, but sometimes it couldn't be helped. Sebastian knew her well enough to guess what was going on in her head. He knew that as soon as he mentioned books, already won. After a few more moments of silence, just to make him sweat, Lily finally nodded. Fine, I'll help. Wipe that smug grin off your face, Mr. Blackwell. Those books better be the real thing, or I'll have a word with your great aunt about this professional witch nonsense. Sebastian paled slightly at the threat, but covered it with a shrug and a laugh, as if the old bat could disdain my existence any more than she already does. If I were you, I'd be more worried about what else she but besides disdain it. Now, when can we look at this house? I'm not going to shuffle around my work schedule for why not now? Sebastian asked, rising and bowing smoothly, an arm outstretched towards the door. Hmm, where is it? Lily asked, considering. South, past Fort Binning. It's on the Chattahoochee River, a bit north of Galufa, Alabama, before the river runs into the reservoir. About two and a half hour drive 
to leave now. We can spend a few hours poking around the house and have you back home by dinner time. Lily glanced at her watch. It was one o'clock. Her failed date with Jerry felt like years ago already and had only been an hour. Despite herself, Brock, despite herself, prospect of an unknown malignant spell and new books to explore too tempting to delay. All right, let's do it, she said, standing up from her desk and moving to the collector purse. You'll have to meet me at my apartment phone, so I need to change and get a few supplies. Still wearing the pretty blue blouse, dark pencil skirt, high heels, gone for the date. Sure thing, Lil. Sebastian tipped an imaginary hat and started for the door. How many times do I have to tell you? Lily began, exasperated. He was already out the door and down the hall. Don't call me that. She finished in a subdued tone, sighing, gathered her things, and followed him out, locking her office door behind her. Oh, wow. All right, Lydia, that was fun. Uh, the book is Love, Lies, and Hocus Pocus uh, Beginnings. Like I said, this is, this is the first of seven in the series. Lydia, thank you very much to get the opportunity to read that. And so much fun. Catch you next week. I am Larry Hoy, biker, writer, legend. And this has been my first chapter podcast. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if I haven't read your book yet, if if you've got a favorite author out there, introduce me. I'd love to I'd love to read their book. And if you're an author out there with a book to share, put me in, man. Drop me an email. I'd love to hear, hear about your book. Um, if you could support my channel, a great way to support it is bum -bum, I write for the Hit World book series. That's from Chris Kennedy Publications. You can find it on Amazon. Uh, my newest book, Demon's Kiss, came out just this spring. Continuation story of Luther Sweetwater. Following, and if you could get that, drop me a heads up. Drop me a comment on Facebook. Either way, catch you next week right here on First Chapter Podcast.